Welcome to Literacy Volunteers of Greater Portland's new tutor training. This presentation will focus on literacy with Lou Bachway to reading and reading fundamentals. In this lesson, you will learn about the four components of literacy, get an overview of the literacy curriculum we use to teach adult students how to read, strengthen your understanding of reading fundamentals, and learn strategies for helping students become proficient readers. The first portion of this presentation will focus on literacy. And there are some facts that you may be interested to know about. You can see um, some of the stats that have been compiled by ProLiteracy at the link posted on this slide, but um, you should know that rates of illiteracy have consistently stayed at about 20% in the United States for the last 20 to 30 years. Many of our students come from places where they did not have the opportunity to go to school and when they arrive in the United States they are confronted with a society that requires you to not just be uh, literate in reading but have computer literacy skills and have cultural literacy as well. Literacy has been expanded beyond the page to include um, many content areas and many of those areas are ones that our students will need to gain some proficiency in in order to be successful um, here. Um, but learning how to read as an adult is really tricky and I, I want to make a distinction here. Not all of our students come from places where they never went to school. Many of them come from places where they have very rich educational systems and so um, folks come to the program with bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, sometimes occasionally PhDs um, and or um, vocational certifications. But there are students who've come from areas where education was not available, either because it wasn't available in the region or because they weren't permitted to access it, perhaps because they were a woman. One of the contributing factors to the complexity of learning to read as an adult has to do with this idea of neuroplasticity, which is essentially the brain's ability to rewire itself. When we're young, um, learning, any kind of learning activity, um, makes new connections and thus rewires our brain. But as an adult, we have to contend with entrenched uh, neural connections uh, and making new connections as adults, especially when it comes to an abstract pursuit like learning to read, can be difficult. And the way that we get around this is by using a time-tested curriculum that allows for a lot of repetition in practice so that those um, skills um, become concrete and so that students can draw parallels between reading fundamentals or literacy fundamentals and reading. When we think about literacy, we divide it into four components. And those are listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And of those four, those four components get divided into two categories, input and output. The input uh, skills are the receptive skills. So while you're required to translate reading, you're not required to write in input. And while you're required to understand what someone is saying to you, you're not required to necessarily um, produce speech. However, if you want to produce speech, those output skills are really important, but they are the most difficult because they require that you understand the rules of language before you use them. I liken these to learning how to play music, for instance. I do not know how to play music. I can listen to a piece of music, appreciate it, and anticipate 
the changes in the movements or the changes in key, but if I sat down at a piano, for instance, to play music, I wouldn't be able to do it because I don't know the rules that govern how to write or play music. Diving a little bit deeper into the four components of literacy, I want to make it clear that listening is a skill. Um, it's passive, but we need to develop our ears and to be able to distinguish words and sounds in a sentence that's being spoken to us in order to understand meaning. If we cannot do that, then it just sounds like garbled sounds in our ear that have no meaning and we're not able to do anything um, if we're required to respond to what's being said to us. Um, and we call that being able to distinguish those words and sounds, auditory discrimination. Um, I oftentimes recommend for students who, who say that they, they struggle to understand when something or someone speaks to them, I recommend often that they listen to short clips in English, uh, maybe two to three minute chunks of spoken words. It could be a news story, perhaps. There are a lot of YouTube videos that are in slow English that give students an opportunity to hear the language and be able to develop auditory discrimination. Um, speaking is a, a, a skill that must be practiced. We talked a little, about, a little bit about um, developing automaticity um, in the last presentation and speaking, as I said, is something that we build on. We start small and we scaffold. We build more onto the scaffold until we're able to um, really be able to speak the language fluently. But the only way we get there is by consistent practice. Um, basic reading skills are, are that range, you know, they range from phonics to comprehension. And um, I want to just make a note that when we're talking about decoding, that's the ability for a student to sound out words. But understand that a student's ability to decode does not correlate with their ability to understand what they've read. It's very possible that you have some students who are not literacy students, perhaps a student who's had a lot of um, practice reading or learning or, you know, in an educational setting who's able to decode the, the phonics in English without understanding any of the meaning. Um, vocabulary is really key when we're talking about um, helping someone learn to read. Um, fluency and comprehension, those are all foundational reading skills, but we'll talk about those further into this presentation. Writing is um, one of the last skills to develop and um, is something that should be included in all of your sessions. Um, it could be helping the student write a list or write a letter, but it's really important to give your student writing exercises that allow them to um, order the rules of the language in written form that can be communicated um, to you or to someone else for specific purposes. Um, I've had many students who've come through literacy volunteer programs ask um, for help with writing because they're required to demonstrate understanding on the job or to communicate in written form on the job and or they realize that their inability to write well in this other language will damage their employment prospects. The Lubach way to reading curriculum is the preferred literacy curriculum for literacy volunteers of Greater Portland. Um, it's a series that was originally published in 1970. It's a four-level, time-tested method that has taught millions of adults to read, and it's ideal for learners who have little or no, no reading skills, likely because they have had little to no formal education and require a uniform, step-by-step -step approach to reading. We've been using the curriculum in Literacy Volunteers of Greater Portland with great success. So tutors notice results um, during the first session they have with the student. Um, by the end of that first session, 
you may have had you may have been working with a student who's never read anything or just really has never been formally taught but by the end of the session they read a whole story which we'll show to you um, in a couple of slides the curriculum uses um, an uncomplicated learning strategy that allows for repetition and practice. It scaffolds grammar in a friendly way that doesn't overwhelm the student, um, but challenges the student to think critically about how language is put together. And it increases vocabulary and teaches comprehension. And most importantly, I think it helps to build confidence. Many times when students have never been to school, they sometimes exhibit some magical thinking around education and or they exhibit um, a lot of apprehension and a lack of confidence. And what we have noticed is that students who go through this curriculum um, see results very quickly, which helps to keep them engaged and encourages them to work a little harder um, and dig deeper to get further in the curriculum. Here's some quotes we've had from students when we've asked them about how the curriculum is working for them. Here is an example of one of the phonics charts um, from the curriculum, and in fact, it's the first phonics chart from the first book. As you can see, there are no vowels on this chart. Vowels come a little bit later because vowels are really tricky, especially for literacy learners, and it has to do with the fact that we've not built up a lot of auditory discrimination by this point. We have to be able to distinguish between those vowel sounds, which when you think about them, sound very, very much alike with the, 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 the inflection is what makes them different. So we focus here on the first six consonants. And I've put the instructions for how you would go through a chart like this on the left side, but we'll go through it together so that you can see how it, it should be used. So you start off in column one. There's a picture of a bird. I know that the picture is a little bit fuzzy, but that's what that picture is. It's a picture of a bird. And then you say the word bird. So you're pointing to it, you're using your fingers the whole way, pointing to the picture, saying bird. Moving to the second column, you pointed to the letter B that has the bird sort of underneath it. And the purpose of that is to anchor that B with the picture. We want to anchor those sounds and the letters with an image. Um, so you would point to the letter B and say the sound B. Moving to the third column, you point to the word bird and say bird, then to the B underneath it and say B, and then the sound B. In the fourth column, you would point to the first B and say the name of the letter, then to the second B and say the sound. So in sequence, it would go something like this, bird, B, B, bird. B, B. This is repeated several times, and you go through this sequence for each row. Um, after um, six or seven times, or even less than that, depending on how much of the alphabet and the alphabet sounds your student knows, you should just be able to point to each letter or to each picture, ask for the student to tell you the name of the letter, and then ask for the student to tell you the sound of the letter. Then moving to the pictures, perhaps asking the student to tell you what the picture is, and then ask pointing to the, the words and asking the student to tell you what the word is. Students are generally able to reproduce this it's a process that allows them to memorize those words while learning and, and getting a solid foundation in the letter sounds. On the next page, um, next to the chart, you'd have the story. And so this is the first story from the first lesson. Um, and so instead of having the student go from learning the chart to immediately jumping into reading the story, we want to give them 
um, I want to model first how to read and, and give them an opportunity to hear these words in a sequence of some kind. Um, so the process for reading the story is also on the left, and we'll go through that. Um, the tutor will read the story through first while the student listens. And you may want to do this a couple of times to give them a chance to follow along and really pay attention. Um, uh, the second step the tutor will read the story through as the student listens and repeats. So you read a sentence, the student repeats the sentence, so on and so forth. And you also might want to do this a couple of times. Step three, the student points, sorry, the tutor points to each word as the student reads alone. You correct as you go and correct as many times as needed, um, asking the student to um, recall what particular sounds you're working on. For instance, if they get to the word girl and they're struggling with that, you can refer back to G, which is a letter and a sound that's included in the first, the first phonics chart. Um, and that gives the student the first, the first place, the first, the starting place for where they would begin to start decoding that letter or sorry, that word. Um, by step four, at the end of the session, the student will be able to read through the story alone with some correction from the tutor. Um, but for the most part, the, the burden of teaching should be off of you, the tutor, by the end of that lesson, the student should be able to read through this independently. Along with the, the curriculum, um, are, is a workbook that allows you to assign homework or do exercises. Um, and then there are also um, two readers. Um, one is a correlated reader that goes, that correlates um, um, from lesson to lesson. It's a different sequence of words, same words, just put in a different sequence. Um, and it gives the student a little extra practice. Um, it also helps the student to begin to develop um, a, a sight word vocabulary. And sight words are words that occur really commonly. They just have to be memorized. Um, but the way we memorize them is by being able to recognize them regardless of the sequence they appear in or the form they appear in. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the scope of the curriculum, and I'm just using images from the book, so uh, apologies um, if the images aren't terribly clear to you. Um, they were taken with the camera phone, but I think that you're able to see from the first book to the second book the difference. Um, so there are uh, more words, the sequence of the or the the structure of the sentences is less repetitive. Um, and that continues through book two. By the time you get to book three, you see your um, you've added um, a lot more narrative. Students may be reading a little bit more um, in content areas. And by book four, you can see that the processing load has quadrupled. Um, there's a lot more words. There's a lot more to understand. And as I said, there are readers and um, workbooks that go along with each of these books, all of them focusing on helping the student learn how to parse the language apart and put it back together again, and in um, understanding that each word functions in a sentence um, so that they're able to start working on writing, understanding how they're putting together sentences so that they can be understood to the reader. The purpose of reading is always comprehension. And for tutors, I think that we think that oftentimes drilling is what we need to do in order to help people become good readers. But understand that if you're doing drills and you're not checking for comprehension, then you're defeating the purpose of a reading, uh, of reading instruction. Um, and also because so many of us do it so easily, it's easy to forget that reading to understand is a skill that took us years of practice to do well.
There are generally recognized five characteristics of a good reader. Uh, they are comprehension, context, interpretation, synthesis, and evaluation. Uh, con the comprehension, I should say, is when the reader can obtain meaning from text. Comprehension occurs when readers make predictions, select main ideas, and understand important details. Context um, involves reading between the lines to identify setting, tone, and the voice of the author. Context also includes placing ideas and concepts in a bigger picture to help students see practical applications. Interpretation um, occurs when students interpret. They fill in gaps in the text using clues and evidence from the text to analyze problems and draw conclusions. Synthesis involves reading between the lines as students must apply and synthesize knowledge from outside the text. And lastly, evaluation occurs when readers are able to express opinions, ask questions, challenge the text, challenge the author, and note bias and distortion. Are um, significant barriers to comprehension, especially for um, literacy students or people who are not practiced readers. Um, the first for literacy students is that there's a lack of foundational knowledge. And foundational knowledge is when we understand that uh, we write from left to right, that the first letter of a sentence is always capitalized, and that we end an idea with a period. Those are our foundational skills. Um, another barrier to comprehension is that the text is too hard. The student does not understand the vocabulary or context of the text. Um, the student can't picture what's happening in their head. And I understand that there are many people out there who are not able to see uh, the movie in their head as they're reading, but this is a skill and it has to be built. And it explains why when we were children, our teachers would ask us to draw pictures of the stories that we were reading, because if we can picture it, then we can demonstrate that we understand. There's a lack of understanding of storytelling, um, which may be a barrier to comprehension. So if the student does not understand storytelling elements, then they're not going to be able to grasp uh, the essentials of the story. For instance, they're not understanding the characters or the setting, the protagonist, the antagonist, the plot, etc. Um, fluency or poor fluency is a significant barrier to comprehension. If the student spends too much time decoding each individual word that the meanings of the sentence get lost in the effort, then by the end of their reading, they're not able to answer any questions about what they read because they were spent, they spent so much of their energy just trying to decode. Um, there's a lack of background knowledge. So the student can't understand the concepts or context because they have no experience, awareness, uh, or awareness of the subject matter. In the Fat City um, video clips, one of those clips refers to background knowledge. He puts up a list of words and asks everyone in the room if they understand those words. Everyone raises their hands and says, yes, we understand. When he put those words together in a paragraph, they made a different meaning. And suddenly, only one person understood. And it was a person who had a background in mathematics because that was what the paragraph was about. It was about a mathematical concept. Um, so background is really important. And for our students, our, their cultural backgrounds will factor into this. There was once a tutor who uh, wanted to, um, well, her, her, her student asked for help um, learning to read children's books because she wanted to read those stories to her children. And the tutor picked out a common book, um, which is uh, a, a favorite among, for, for children. It was Clifford, the Big Red Dog. But her student was from Somalia, and the student had no, no context for understanding a pet. And so that was a difficult barrier to overcome as they tried to work with that particular text. Um, they eventually uh, resolved that and moved on to another text, but these are certain things to, to just be aware of. There are things that we can do to support comprehension. Um, reading comprehension is the act of understanding what you're reading. So while the definition can be simply stated, the act is not simple to teach, learn, or practice. 
reading comprehension is an intentional, active, interactive process that occurs before, doing, during, and after a person reads a particular piece of writing. So one of the things that's important to do if you're using the newspaper or any sort of content area text, it's important to know that, that your student understands the vocabulary. And we there's a, a concept called pre-teaching, which is what you do before you begin. If you recall being in school, sometimes your teacher would give you vocabulary words, which preceded the reading of a, of a story or new unit. And your teacher was at that time pre-teaching. She was giving you the information you needed to get through the parts of that, that unit, which may have been challenging to you if you did not know those concepts. The same is true for adults. If you don't know the concepts, you're not going to understand the, the, uh, the context you're not going to be able to answer any questions about what you read. Um, so pre-teaching is crucial. Having discussions with your students before you begin an activity is also crucial. It's a, it's a priming activity. It helps to, um, um, it gives us an opportunity actually to talk about background so that we can find out if the student does have any background knowledge that can be brought to bear and utilized or uh, juxtaposed against what it is that we'll be reading. It's important to set a purpose or a goal for your reading so that you know what you're driving towards and to make personal connections. Ask questions to double check that your student has understood and to locate the point at which uh, they got lost or comprehension became um, difficult. Um, preview those readings before you give them to your students so that you understand what they contain and teach your student how to preview the reading too if they're not sure. Um, you know, if it's a book, reading the back of the book or reading the jacket um, is important. Looking through the table of contents um, to determine how many chapters there are, for instance. And making predictions. Making predictions is, a, is an important skill, and it's one that many writers um, really depend upon the, the reader to have. Um, there are times when we pick up a book because we know exactly what it's going to be, and, and so we, we need to predict the experience that we're going to have. But also, when we're reading something, if we're able to predict what's going to happen next, then we know that the student has understood what happened before. If the prediction that um, they make is often left field, then we want to find out uh, why they, they think that's the case. And if, if it's possible that they misunderstood something that happened earlier in the text. We talked about fluency, which is, of course, um, reading smoothly, um, or poor fluency is reading um, is sort of working really hard to decode each individual word. Um, and some of the things that we can do to help students build fluency is model um, reading aloud, uh, demonstrate what it's supposed to sound like using inflection and flow, uh, ensure that the student has mastered words and can read in phrases before presenting them with the text, give them opportunities to hear a text, then read it silently before reading it out loud. That way they're using their ears, their eyes, and their voice. Um, choral reading or shadow reading is when a tutor and a student read together at kind of a sing-song pace. Tons of repetition, of course, is needed um, if you're going to do any of these things. And think that poems are a really good tool because they have this natural rhythm and, um, and they're meant to be recited. I mentioned that um, seeing the picture in your head is a way to demonstrate to yourself that you understand um, and that some people are not able to do that because it's a skill that has to be taught. You have to learn how to do it. So here are some ways that you can um, that you can build this skill for yourself if you need to or for your student. It's called active reading and these are active reading strategies. Um, so ask pre-reading questions, of course. Close eyes uh, visualization 
is good. And I sometimes practice this with students um, with poems that have a lot of imagery or description that has a lot of imagery. And then afterwards, we talk about what we saw, what we felt, what we smelled, um, what we heard. Um, stop throughout the text, text and ask your student to explain what is happening. Draw pictures if that's helpful or act things out. Teach story elements. Um, there's a strategy called sticky notes snapshot. And so when you take sticky notes and, um, you know, in, at critical points in the story or book or article, write down um, what happened so that you don't lose track of that um, incident or the element um, and then review making predictions. We talked about drawing conclusions and um, it may be helpful um, as a as a comprehension and active reading strategy to write a report or a brief paragraph that summarizes what was read. This is assignment six, um, and it's a scenario. So we'd like for you to consider the following. You're working with an intermediate student. Your student is interested in reading the article posted below. Which words do you need to pre-teach before you begin reading? The article we have here is courtesy of Newzella. Here's a link to it. Skim through it. Remember the student is an intermediate student and we talked about um, the stages of language acquisition. So we know that at the intermediate level, the student has about 6,000 words in their vocabulary, between five and 6,000 words in their vocabulary. Um, so they know a lot, but there may be some key concepts or um, culturally specific language that will need to be explained to them. And that's it for this presentation. Thank you so much for your time. Um, as usual, put your assignments in a Word document or as the body of an email and send those off to Rachel. And we'll see you in the next presentation.